Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. I'm your host, JP and John Paz. With me today, a very special guest. You may know him as Sign Guy Dudley or Lou E. Dangerously. He is, of course, Lou D'Angelo. Welcome to the Two Man Power Trip, Lou. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's it good to be here. And you can tell everybody about our scheduling fiascos or mine for the last three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were going back and forth for a while. That's all right, though. Hey, it happens. Hey, it's better than I uh, had this one... Not legendary guy, but pretty famous guy. Back and forth for a year, and I was like, "Yeah, he's, this guy's never coming." Seriously? On. So, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he no, finally was like, "Yeah, I'm free. Let's do it." I'm like, "Oh my god, what the hell?" So that's nothing to me. Three weeks. Oh, is cool. Nothing. So three reschedules. It's unlike me, but um, yeah, it's been a, a busy time. So I appreciate it. And it's so good to be on. Yeah, what's going on in your world though? What's been keeping you so busy? Uh, so I, I have this new job <laughs> back in the wrestling business. Um, which is one of the reasons I delayed speaking with you. But I, I recently came on full time with Impact Wrestling and Anthem um, Sports and Entertainment. I had been consulting for Impact since uh, since February, and uh, it's mostly on the live event marketing stuff. But we had a lot of conversations, and as things kind of progressed, a really good opportunity presented itself for me to be their VP of marketing for for Impact. Um, also working with the uh, Invicta MMA business as well, which I'm really excited about. And then obviously there are other platforms, Gravitas and Fight and Access TV and, and whatnot are all things I'm, I'm sure I'll be involved in. They're not in, within my purview per se, but there's a lot of opportunities that are cross promotionally and things like that that frankly I think are, are great opportunities for, for Impact, also for Invicta, but it's a good family of, uh, of, of companies all together that really kind of can feed off each other. So I saw a lot of opportunity there, um, you know, coming from WWE, ECW, Cirque du Soleil and whatnot, there's always been multiple things, you know, that you can market within these companies. And I found a lot of synergies in the past and I think the same thing is going to be here. So pretty exciting time. Yeah, they'll be keeping you busy, like you said, with MMA, Impact. I mean, they're going to keep you very busy over there. Yeah, that's what I like, Ken. It's not a – I don't like to not be doing things. It's uh, it's always been a thing of mine. I think uh, maybe like occasionally a couple days or a vacation or whatever, but not in the long run. I like to be uh, like to be busy, like to be affecting change, which is another reason I wanted to join because I felt that there's a lot we can do collectively that we can also move forward um, quickly. You know, I've been in situations in past companies where it's the idea is there. It just takes a really long time to execute and to get everybody on board. But here's there's a lot of freedom. Um, Scott and I have a very close relationship so far, and I anticipate that just getting better as we as we go. Uh, we feed off each other a lot. Um, he has great marketing ideas and you know, very supportive of some of the things I'm trying to trying to do as well. So I see nothing but positivity um, as we go and onward. Dumb question. What do you do as VP of marketing? Like, what's like the the gig? Like, what do you be doing? What will you be doing? Yeah, so from the impact side, it's everything to promote the live events, uh, as well as the brand, as well as tune in, pay per view, merchandise, digital, PR, social. I mean, it's a it's a large scope. Um, with Invicta, similar, just not as far along yet. Um, but also with Impact too, it's like how we're using our talent, how we use our talent assets, like social media. What are we doing? What can we do more for live events? For instance, I just start having um, local promo shot again, like the old house show promos, like, hey, I'm coming to Las Vegas and blah, 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 blah. And those are just easy things um, that don't sound complex, but they're, you know, they are, they have a good effect. And in the past, I just, you know, it's a very, very small team and not everybody can be doing everything. Right. And I think things like that start using, uh, the best people we have to promote us and that's that's the talent and when we're going in the cities you, you'll probably see from watching the show we don't have all our matches you know the way our storylines are on and the tv runs you might not be getting matches until like a couple days before the show but that doesn't mean we can't be telling people these guys are going to be there and that's right. kind of the goal with some of the stuff is like if uh if uh mosh is going to be and in, in las vegas and she, we know she's going to have a match. We probably know who it's against, but we can't say it yet. It's still letting people know, right? And I think that's a lot of the stuff. The talent reach is enormous. You know, if you – there was um, something I did – or we did, sorry, like a month and a half ago pushing pushing some uh, match announcements out for one of the shows. And, you know, within six, seven, talent alone, you're hitting, you know, two million people because so many – so many of them have big followers. So, look, it's a lot of that stuff. It's like maximizing opportunities, growing the business – 
um, seeing what else we can do to get eyes on the brand and brand partnerships, extremely easy to work with, which I think is the plus, you know, so a lot of that's come, come to fruition. We just did something uh, last summer, at, uh, in, last summer, it's kind of still summer, but in, at Comic-Con in San Diego, you know, had a red carpet event, had Scott, Rosemary, Giselle there, did a bunch of content. Like those are the types of things that I want to be doing and bringing those partnerships along. There are partners, excuse me, they're all partnerships I've had in the past with different companies, but no better place than now and here. Very true. And that's such an old school thing for wrestling, but it was such a good marketing tool that the guy, you know, Hogan would be like, come to San Jose, brother, you know, whatever. I mean, it was a good marketing yeah. tool back then. Still uh, reliable today. Yeah. And those are just, they're easy to do. Right. And it's, it's funny because a lot of these guys maybe haven't done that quite before because of just the way the business kind of works now where it's a, it's not always like uh, it's not a house show it's, for us. It's always TV or pay-per-view and majority of the time the matches are coming. But to me, it's like, we'll record stuff this weekend in Nashville for Las Vegas. At that That's at the end of the month. Um, we have no matches, but we know the people are going to be there. So the, the talent that's going to be there. So huge opportunity. Why do you think wrestling went away from those for a while? I think the, you know, it's, it's a really good question. I think in a way there was so much content being done and this is just a theory. There's a lot of content being done. Um, there's a lot of promotion for the live events as it is. Um, I don't know if that's the best use for, for some companies to do that. Um, I think ultimately, I think every company should do it. I remember when I was at WWE, um, 2006, 2010, I was working on the ECW brand is one of the things I wanted to bring back there. And it was just, it never got approved you know, because that was like, you know, again, social assets, all these localization, people want to know you're coming to the town. They want to know what you're going to see, um, who you're going to see and whatnot. So not entirely sure why it stopped, but I do know um, from back in the day, it's an enormously long shoot. Um, if you're doing, you know, 15 cities and everybody appearing there, it's very long. I mean, that's a day, two days straight. So that's probably a piece of it. Um, not entirely sure. It's just, that's my theory. But I, you know, with Impact in here, I see it as something that we absolutely can do. So with Impact, you're on full board, but you actually were helping them consulting since February. Correct. So there's some chemistry there. Obviously, like you said, with Scott, you guys have a good, good relationship. What about the boys? Like you're 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 very familiar with the talent. I mean, you're yeah, you good relationship, if you will. Yeah, and part of the reason, Scott, when we first start talking, it was. You know, maybe it's consultant goes into this role where I'm at now. So it actually it did it did happen. But the first two or three months was like hang out, see the production, you know, see how we do things, um, meet some of the guys. Cause you know, I haven't been around the business in a long time. I mean, it's been oh man, I mean, it's probably close to eleven years. I mean, I did some stuff in Chicago with Billy Corgan in two thousand twelve. That's probably it. So a lot of these guys I didn't know, even though I knew who they were, but I didn't like know them. And I would tell you that I think it was uh, the second uh, set of shows I was at in Poughkeepsie, New York, is when everything started kind of clicking for me a little bit, where I saw the locker room is exactly as it was described to me. They're, they're good people. It's a team environment. There's no silos. There's none of the stuff you may see or have seen in other places. And they're just all trying to help. You know, and so when I went still as a consultant, we had a show in Orlando and Scott had a meeting with everybody just going through like a bunch of things and also kind of gave a reason why I'm there. Right. Because no, no one kind of knew. I'm just like wandering around and looking at things. And I'll tell you, not even a minute or two after that meeting, I had three people like, hey, we want to try this. We want to try a community outreach. We want to try boys and girls clubs. We need to do better with Twitch and TikTok and all these types of things. And we, we were able to listen and do a lot of that. So that kind of had me on board right away and just, you know, again, good positive attitudes and people wanting to, uh, to, to grow and grow the brand. Did you miss the business when you were away from it? Aspects of it. Uh, I definitely miss, you know, hanging out with, with your, your buddies and whatnot. Cause it's just a certain kind of, uh, you know, it's a chemistry you really can't describe. It's a, it's a locker room. It's a sports locker room where it's a team. Uh, so I missed that piece. I just also miss like the, the whole the whole piece of wrestling that got me into it which was like the excitement but now knowing how the excitement happens now knowing how things work and 
you know, in 1985, I didn't know anything, but now after spending so much time in it, you know, so I started missing that stuff. But the biggest challenge I would say, you know, in 11 years was I had, I didn't want to do anything in wrestling, mostly because I know the travel. And I, at the time, my kids were very young, you know, two and five, and now they're 13 and 17. So I always felt in the back of my mind, I'd, I'd find my way back in the business somehow. But I also always said that I would never do it at this point in my life at, you know, talking 10, 11 years ago. And so it kind of came up now and believe it or not, like I really didn't realize how much I missed it, to be honest. I know I missed it, but now in it is like, wow, I really, really missed it, you know? And it's a good point in my career and time to do it again. When you were away from it, was that kind of purposeful? You kind of wanted to get away from it? No, I, you know, I didn't No, I, it was just where my career was going. I spent four years at WWE got recruited by Cirque to move to Vegas and run the, the, the uh, marketing here for the shows. And I just got engulfed in that. Like that was kind of what I was doing. And I would watch the shows if one of my buddies was on or it's just something I just wanted to see. It's not like I was turning bookings down or anything like that. I mean, right. no call in anyway, but there was definitely like things that um, I did not avoid. I know a lot of people say, Oh, I didn't watch it for 11 years. That's not true. I did. Um, just not religiously. My daughter, too, my youngest, really start getting into like Sasha and Becky and everything like that. So they were in Las Vegas. Devon brought her backstage to meet them. It's like those types of experiences. Like I did want to create for my kids and it was cool to do it. Um, and even on those nights, like the one night you go back at a WWE show, it's like for the next couple of days, you're like, wow, man, I missed this. And then just kind of you go back in your job and, and go that way. How was Cirque de Soleil? Oh, I can never pronounce it. Cirque de Soleil or whatever. Call the it Cirque. Cirque. Yeah, yeah. Cirque de Soleil, but Cirque. Yeah, Cirque. yeah there you go. Yeah, yeah. How was so how, it? Yeah, like how was that experience? Like how did you get in? You said they recruited you. It just seems yeah. like it's so not out there, but it's different than wrestling for sure. Yeah, I mean the, the premise of the initial conversation with them was they were having trouble with ticket sales. And they had uh, at the time – I think it was seven shows in the market in Las Vegas alone. So there was trouble with ticket sales. There was trouble with diversification of product. Um, my background obviously was in entertainment my whole life, but also within ticketing and marketing. Um, so they wanted some fresh eyes on it and they didn't want somebody that came directly from like a Broadway business or um, a theater business. They wanted a, like a live event promoter. So that's, that's what I was. So yeah, it was totally different. However, I was a fan of the product before I even had a conversation with them. So it made a very easy conversation. Also, I had to relocate from Philadelphia to Las Vegas with my, again, very young family at the time. But look, it was a it was a really good experience for the majority of the time I was there. I think that uh, we definitely had challenges, you know, with COVID and whatnot. But, man, we went through a lot. And it was uh, we definitely got some some cool things done. I mean, 11 years when I look back on it, it's pretty long. Um, but the experience overall was great. Uh, a lot of great people there. Um, a lot of cool things I experienced from a business side. For instance, we Cirque was acquired by a private equity company. It's since been sold, but going through that whole acquisition and seeing how those types of things work and seeing what those meetings are like and what information you need to be accountable for and just how it just goes, goes, goes. That that was a huge lesson just in business. But I got to do it. You know, I think a lot of people were freaked out by that situation or situations in general. But I always looked at it as like, if I'm included, there's a, there's a way to grow this, right? Just personally in, in, in your career. Overall, really good. Um, loved working with the Beatles and Apple and, and those guys. And, you know, they're all really good people. So I hope they do well in the future. Do you think that, like, that was like, uh, I don't know, like culture shock a little bit? Like I got to move to, from Philly to Vegas. I got to do this, you know, do the Cirque stuff rather than the, you know, the wrestling game, if you will. I mean, it's a yeah. culture shock a little bit had to be. Yeah. I, I, look, relocating anytime. I've relocated three times in my career um, is always hard. Uh, however, I just found myself and my wife and now my kids to be very adaptable to these situations. And frankly, I didn't think I'd be in Vegas for 11 years. I thought I'd be like maybe three. And it was, you know, I was in Fort Collins for two and a half years, back to Philadelphia for a couple of years. I think that, uh, you know, you acclimate yourself as quickly as possible in Cirque and a lot of the other, you know, couple of companies were really good. You know, it's you fly out here for a month or a couple of weeks just to get a, an idea of what it's like, you know, the schools, what are they like, et cetera. The biggest thing about Vegas that I think at the time was really unknown was like life off the strip, right? Everybody just knows the strip. And, you know, as I 
came along, I was like, wow, you know, 15 miles off the strip is just like a suburb that I live in Philadelphia in Las Vegas. People just don't know about it. And that's changed greatly. You know, people do know about it now. It's a good place to live, good cost of living. So, yeah, culture shock for sure. But, it, you know, got brought along fairly fast with a bunch of really good people in the beginning. You know, a lot of old school, like wrestling guys, managers, whatever, like they have their own shows and they always say wrestling has become like Cirque and, and they're doing all this <laughs> Cirque stuff. Have you have you heard that? Have you noticed that? Have you have you seen I, that? I yourself? haven't heard that for a while, but I, I had heard it for sure. Um, yeah. And maybe that's some of that's true. You know, I don't I look at it with different lenses. Like when I look at Cirque, I don't think wrestling unless we, we used to have a show that had like a masked wrestler in it for like a second. Um, so then maybe. But other than that, you know, I, we have a couple Cirque has a couple guys also who used to be like performers. Or, I'm sorry. There are performers now that were talent in WWE. So there's some life cycle stuff there as well, which I think is interesting. But yeah, I totally have heard it before. It's just not recently. Um, is what it is, I guess, you know, it's there, I guess there's some truth to it, but at the same time, it's, you know, Cirque, you have a wheel of death where guys are, you know, going around this wheel doing flips and the wheel keeps moving. And it's as big as the stage. And in wrestling, it's, you know, there's a steel cage match, right? There's no similarity between the two. Yeah. Or a barbed wire match, you know, so some, as far as, you know, being an athlete, I think it's very comparable, you know, Cirque shows the average performers doing 460 shows a year. And, wow you know, really yeah, yeah it's oh two a night you know, 10 shows a week obviously there's breaks so there's quite a lot of demand on the body and obviously wrestling is almost similar you know very very similar with travel um which definitely compounds it a little bit but there's that many shows wow that's that many shows for each show <laughs> so i mean you're upwards of like i forget the number now but it's it was maybe at one point over 3000 total shows in the market a year from Cirque between all the different offerings. So do you think, do you think that was overkill at all? Do you think it's too many shows? Uh, looking back on it now. And you know, even when I was in it, I, a few of us absolutely did, you know, it's just, it's market saturation. The biggest problem that we tried to solve. And I think over the course of 11 years, we solved it. Sometimes we didn't solve it. Sometimes was differentiation between the product. People just hear Cirque. And it's like, oh, it's this one show at MGM. Oh, it's the one show at the Mirage or it's the one show at the Bellagio. They don't know those three shows are all different shows, right? So that 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 becomes a problem. And then, you know, it's, it's share of voice and market share. You have so many shows that you have to compete against so many other shows, which the landscape changed here completely when they start doing headliners and bringing in more, more people to fuel entertainment. So, you know, I, if I'm them at this point, I probably look at like, what, what do we actually need? Um, but yeah, I think at a point for sure there was that feeling. Because I know there's a ton of tourists that come into Vegas. I mean, millions yeah. upon millions. But I was like, man, that seems like it's a crazy amount of shows. And That's crazy 40, for the boys yeah, or 40. for the guys, the performers. What was the last part you said? Sorry. Crazy for the performers, too. Oh, yeah. I have 44 million, 42, 44 million people a year coming to Las Vegas. And that's between conventions and obviously tourism, international, and within the States, Canada, whatnot. And it's... uh. You know, now you have the Cirque shows, but you also have, you know, Aerosmith headlining, you know, 30 shows a year as a residency, Bruno Mars. Um, I'm missing a bunch. Katy Perry, you know, everyone's starting to do that model now. And then plus you have all the UFC fights here at yep. T-Mobile and you have the hockey team for 42 home games, um, 41, sorry. And then you have the Raiders now, <laughs> you know, now the WNBA this is just a lot. And that wasn't the case 11 years ago. So. 11 years, 11 years ago, I don't think anybody was thinking seven's too many. I think in the last five years, you, you have no choice but to think that. And WB has been running there a few times. Like, yeah, that everybody's running right. Vegas, yeah. No, look, the stadium, they did, um, I don't know if it was one or two stadium shows, but they're frequently here. AEW did three shows here in a week, you know, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. They did really well ticket sales-wise, but ultimately that's, that's pulling from everything else, you know. Yeah. Definitely. But, yeah, WB had the one stadium show, and then they tried to do the second one. But for right. some reason, they had yeah. UFC on the same exact night. You're not going to – you know what I mean? That That's like – that's just crazy. They shouldn't have – they yeah. maybe pick a different night. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that wasn't the smartest decision, but it was good. They moved it. You know, <laughs> they were able to still do it. Yep. Stadiums are risky, man. I've, I've, I've as a When I worked at WWE as a, as a live events guy and promoting WrestleManias and things like that in stadiums, it's it's a lot. Because it just doesn't, you know, most of the time it does really well on the on sale. 
um, and whatnot, but you still have those extra like 5,000 seats you have to move for three weeks. You know, it's, it's, it's very daunting. Um, and it's also to a stadium can't be like half full, right? It looks awful. So yep. Yep. it seems like they were trying to do a lot of stadiums like they were doing clash of the castle, which obviously was, uh-huh. was over in, in, in Cardiff. When they do that, when they have that plan, is that just because they think like that area is booming? Do they think the company is booming and they'll come like, like what's the thought process that we're doing live events? Is it the area itself? Is it the product itself? Is it a mix of both? Uh, I think in the, the situation you're referring to, and they were paid a lot to go do do that show. Oh, that was a paid show. Okay. I, I think, and look, I'm not there, and I don't, I don't know for sure, but I know when they were going overseas for these really big shows, I'm sure they were they were paid to do those um, without a lot of risk. Um, to answer your question more generally, like with live events for for us or when I, at WWE, it is markets a big one, right? So you want to hit the major markets, um, and you want to hit them on a schedule that doesn't overload it. You know, it's like I'm surprised as much as I, I like a lot of the guys in AEW, they're playing Chicago so much. Yeah. Right. It's just like eventually, eventually it's going to run out. And then you don't want to do that. Right. You want to have, a you know, one or two shows in a market in a big market every year, uh, maybe three. Um, but for us, it's always look, it's location, what we need to shoot for TV or a pay-per-view because we're shooting every show at this point, how the crowd's going to look, um, how the interest in our product is in that market and whatnot so i think the, all those factors and look cost is a big one too you know it's a lot easier to do shows you know where a lot of our talent live on the east coast or whatnot because they some of them can drive they're short flights when you come out to las vegas it's a completely different ball game so you have to take those things in consideration as well when they do wrestlemania two nights is that like double the expense or that's it's just one expense because you have it and you have the stadium for two days. I'm always curious about like that aspect of it because you have it and it's good for two days or you're paying double expenses for everything. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's exactly double, but the second night like isn't free. You know what I mean? There's still a zillion things on the production side that have to change and be done. Um, I don't think I would be surprised if that was an enormous cost savings. I can only, you know, tell from, experiences I had in the past where sometimes, I mean, it's a little bit, but a lot of times it's not what people think, you know, you're renting equipment or whatnot. You rent it for one day or two days. It's, it's a difference, you know, staff is there each night, uh, pyro, all these extra things have to happen. So I wouldn't call it exactly a break even or, um, yeah. So last year they had six, it was a 65 and 65. So technically a total of 130 as far as people coming into the building, as far as ticket sales. I'm not sure if that's exactly correct. Maybe it's more like 55, but they said 65 or somewhere around this. So I'll just say that. So is that just what they're looking at? Oh, we're going to get 130 for the weekend rather than just the 65 and we can make double the money. So that kind of offsets the cost of renting it, you know, basically two days. Yeah, I mean, I think they're, I mean, as far as the actual live event, I mean, the gates are enormous, but they're making, you know, everybody's making money on the pay-per-view. Right. Um, I would say that if you're going to have a show and the first night's going to sell out at 65000 you think you can do an extra 20000 the next night, it probably makes sense to do something on both nights for a live event standpoint. That doesn't mean doing, you know, whatever, WrestleMania on a Saturday and then – throwing everything out into an arena the next night. It's like, you do keep the space. Just hope you sell the tickets. I'm glad I'm not there for that, man. I know the guys who, who work on it and I know it's, it's a grind and it's an incredible amount of stress. Um, so it's a, it's a daunting task. Like I said before, 65,000 seats over two nights, is a lot to sell. To me, though, they had a great marketing uh, ploy, or whatever you want to say last year. Steve Austin, night one. Lesnar yeah. Reigns, night two. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, it might not be that hard to, you know, especially with Austin. <laughs> no, that's a that's yeah. a really good point. Um, yeah, Steve for the first night. I mean, that's, that's a home run <laughs> right away, right away. So I think they did a good job at splitting the matches and who was doing what on each night. I just don't know if that's sustainable every year, but again – that's their product. They know what they're doing. There's probably, you know, a lot of sponsors are probably really happy about that and getting that, all that exposure and the buildings are sure for sure. Getting all the F and B and merchandise. I know their merchandise absolutely crushes. So it's good. It's probably a really good model. It's just going to be interesting. See if, like you said, like they could sustain that 
two days every year because it's like, yeah. do you have enough matches? I know last year they did. Two years ago they might have, but it's like, will they continue to have it that much every year? Who knows? Yeah. Well, maybe it'll be a WrestleMania tournament one day where it's one night feeds in the, like the Crockett Cup back in the day. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. That'd, that'd be pretty cool. Actually, yeah. I shouldn't have said it on air. We could probably steal that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think does NWA. I guess NWA technically owns Crockett Cup, so you didn't have to come. Yeah, up no, I wasn't that. saying like exactly call it Crockett Cup. Oh, okay. Like, we'll rename it the the Two Man Podcast Cup or something. Right. Like that. Right. You're not obviously you're not getting the Road Warriors or the the Sheep Herders or you know you're not even yeah. Midnight Express. I mean, we're not getting any of those guys. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that would <laughs> yeah. be uh, that was a great time though. That's exactly the time I I was started watching wrestling when when all those guys were uh, were, were there. And so basically the mid eighties is when you kind of got into it. Eight, yeah. 84, 85, you know, the, I started watching, I actually started watching NWA and then got into WWF. Um, NWA, I always just had a, a different kind of passion for it. And they used to, you know, Philadelphia civic center, 10,000 people just used to rock. And that was a hell of an environment. And then, you know, WWE, you know, there was nights that WWF, sorry, was at the spectrum and five miles away. NWA is at the civic center same night you know rick flair over here hogan over here everyone's drawn well it's crazy time but i always would pick nwa <laughs> really i wonder what drew you more to them than wbf uh, at the time, i think it was more the 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 storylines that the grind the blood the gimmick matches i just their characters like their guys like you know nikita koloff magnum ta best of seven series things like that are just that was awesome and WWE was just a different offering. I, I mean, I'd still go. It was just different, right? Hogan would have an 11 to 15 minute match. Ric Flair's doing an hour. You know, and it's like those, that kind of appealed to me more. Um, rock and Roll, Midnight Express, like seeing those matches live. I saw a title change live. I thought the building was going to fall over. It was so cool. Two out of three falls match, Philadelphia Civic Center. They did things like that. And I feel like every Civic Center show I went to had some kind of cool gimmick match. Um that I just always would draw me in. And then when it came to the spectrum, it was a little more, you know, it was because they weren't doing it all the time. It was a little bit more special, but we have all that wrestling in one town, man. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of TV. Well, at the time it was like what, two or three hours of TV to watch. It's not a lot um, compared to now. Yeah, man. Who yeah, think about that, but th that's like the great golden era of wrestling to me like that eric because you had so many good guys in nwa and it's like damn you turn it up they had equally as many good guys oh, but yeah. going back and forth it's just nuts flair obviously forget about it you know could, could be right. considered the goat but then you got hogan on the other hand in a different way could be considered the goat who was like your guy though who was like the guy you you really got into was it flair uh it was flair it was also um the original four horsemen it was also it was all the heels also the midnight express Nikita Koloff, those types of guys. Tully Blanchard, I loved um, that whole that whole era. And then WWE was always Roddy Piper, and then Bret Hart, and uh, Shawn Michaels as well in his heyday. Those guys were always just reliable but fun to watch too. Reliable that you know it's going to be cool. Um, yeah. When uh, I used to go to some shows, it was funny when they opened up. I guess it was, I guess, really was it the Wachovia Center when they when they uh -huh. opened when the original name of it. But WCW would then run the Spectrum. So it's funny, like yeah. through the yeah. through the years, how that changed, like Civic Center Spectrum, and then all of a sudden it's yeah. like Spectrum WCW. Wachovia was was um, WWF. Yeah, yeah. I was um, I worked at Wachovia Center for four years, but I don't think uh, at that time. Yeah, I think WCW was either done or they were. We were just using that first union center was that. So it was Wachovia Center. It was Core States, Wachovia First Union, and I think it's Wells Fargo now. But yeah, yeah. I mean, that, and look, right, it changed a lot, right? I mean, wrestling changed a lot in general, where you can't you can't have two shows in the same town anymore. You know, expect to do well. It's just a, it's a different landscape. But I remember WC doing, WCW doing the Spectrum was really cool to me because that's where I saw my first show as well. So going there and just seeing it and in, in that setup in that arena just that was cool in and of itself i mean it come obviously there was a ton of production versus what we used to see in the 80s but it's a cool feeling when you used to go to those buildings did you watch the prism network when you were oh, yeah. uh, home are you in philadelphia no asbury park 
Oh, okay. So you're familiar with, okay. So I was yeah, like, reading yeah. all these references. <laughs> Prism is a huge <laughs> reference. So literally came, our favorite spot for wrestling was to go down to like Philly. Just out of the crowds are better. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. No, I, um, I didn't have, I didn't have cable growing up until, I don't know when I probably later in high school. So I would bother my friends to go over. If I didn't go to the show Saturday night, I'd bother my friends to go over and watch it. It was like one o'clock on Sunday, I believe um, from the night before. And even if I went to the show, I still wanted to go watch, watch the show again. So yeah, definitely uh prism was, and now, you know, you can see every show, you know, through all the, the different offerings WWE has. So it's, it's cool to watch those, but yep. Prism guy when, uh, but not in my house. <laughs> It's funny, like looking back, we had MSG Network here in, in New Jersey, so yeah. you know you'd, you'd see the big matches, but then they'd also be like, okay, there's Prism, then there's Nesson, and you're like, damn yeah. it, I wish I was in Boston, I wish I was in Philly, or like had those stations, or LA had the the Z Channel, yeah. so it's like yeah. all these different places, but they all had these awesome matches that you're like, oh, got to see those matches, like it's just oh, crazy, right. yeah. But it was awesome because they were able to do – I mean, they had their own angles and programs in each town. Philly was yeah. different than Boston. It was different from L.A. They had their own local things. And to our point earlier, that's when local promos really worked, right, because it definitely wasn't the same. Um, obviously, there's some similarities, but when, as I got smarter the business and start seeing how everything was going, I was always thought it was cool that, like, you know, you're doing Piper and Schnooka in one city, and then, you know, that's building to a cage match. But in the other city, it's Piper – an Orndor for Piper and Orton against whoever at the time, um, Snooka, Tonga Kid, whatever, grow into a different angle. I just thought that was neat. It was really cool, especially when they're doing sh two shows on the same day and doing all kinds of different things. I love it. Like, if you go back and look, it's like, okay, Hogan is wrestling Harley Race on the Prism Network. And, yeah. like, there's blood involved. There's table. I mean, it's crazy. And then, <laughs> you know, then, like, Hogan's at MSG against the one-man gang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a just completely different side of Hogan, but totally. he'll go to you know what I mean. But he'll go to yeah, different places, yeah. and it's a bloody. They're like, wait, this isn't the Hogan we we see on TV. It's so funny. I love those. I mean, I think what was it? Uh, trying. I mean, they used to do like the the Phantom title, or not the Phantom title change. What's it called? They do a title change that wouldn't be acknowledged, right? And, and it's, it didn't happen all the time, but by next week's TV, it wasn't. Didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, so, this that was yeah. hysterical. I also like how they used to like test the big matches out. Like I remember when they were doing Luger and this is coming a little more current, I guess, but Luger and uh, Lex Luger and Yokozuna for, I guess that was mania. And then they, um, but they tried, like they did a, a, a singles match in like a very small market, you know, two weeks before. I thought that was always interesting too, just to see how it was actually going to go over. Um, in ECW, we never did that. So <laughs> it's like, I hope it works. Yeah, and I was just talking to somebody the other day. They were saying, remember when Luger came out with the belt? And I said, yes, he came out with the belt, like this local market. The crowd wanted to see how he react. He kind of turned it into a joke, yeah. and then he handed the belt to Cornette, or actually yeah. threw the belt to Cornette because Yoko – like they were almost like testing it out, and they were kind of making it as a joke, but they were really – you could tell Vince was probably thinking like, hmm, let's see how the crowd reacts to Luger yeah. walking out with the title. You know what I mean? Like They, were they definitely 100% did that. They would do it. I when I was in college, and I was at University of Hartford, and I go to WWE shows at the Civic Center and, and the Springfield Civic Center. They would do, you know, the, they would have. I think it was Razor Ramon and maybe IRS when they did the whole, you know, his brief, his chains got repossessed. Yep. And every night, like Razor would be up, he'd leave, like, and I when I say like, you know how they do the title change and they reverse it really quickly. Yes. Yep. The other ref comes out. This was like he was like in the locker room, and there was nights I was like, did they really just like switch the, just do this title change? And then a match later, they'd be like, oh, blah 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 blah. And again, I didn't know what was happening, but now you know you do. It was testing. Is this guy gonna be over as a babyface or whatnot? Yep, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's funny like to see like them do that or throw a match out there sometimes yeah. and then and then you never see the match again you're like oh i thought that was you know they were going to build something i thought that was going to be a house show match maybe vince didn't yeah. like it or somebody didn't like it like nope Probably. yeah like it's, it's over with it's very funny and they're like okay is luger the guy at that point is he the guy but then they'd have brett and brett was apparently getting better reactions so yep. vince, vince is kind of playing a little tug of war and then he's like okay 
Brett, you know, obviously as you lead to WrestleMania 10, Brett was getting a lot better reaction. So oh, Brett super obviously over. was super yeah. over. That's why I enjoyed watching him for so long, you know, and, uh, you know, I worked with him a couple times when I was at WWE. It was really cool just to even be around him. I just always thought he was awesome, you know, from the promos to the look, to the move sets for just everything, you know, uh, really just awesome. I was at WrestleMania 10, so you had Luger versus Yoko first, and obviously Brett versus Owen. Greatest, yeah. one of the greatest matches in Mania history. Obviously, it's the greatest first match went for you yeah. know to lead off the show in Mania history. Owen beats Brett, but the crowd reacted yeah. so strong to Brett, and obviously it was one of the people who reacted strong. They weren't really that into Luger as much, you know what I mean? He loses to yeah. Yoko. They weren't like. You know what I mean? It wasn't tremendous heat for, for, for Yoko beating him. It was almost like, okay, yeah. let's get that get get on to the real main event of Yoko and Brett. Yeah, no, but I mean you think about it, now as you look at it, you can probably see it, right? I mean, Brett, again, super over. The Owen stuff was amazing. And that was gaining so much traction. I think Luger was just to me it, it to me at that time, I saw it all kind of the same. Right? It's like I thought Luger was over, but I enjoyed watching Brett more. But now you look at it, you know exactly why those things were happening. Um, yeah, which is interesting. And I haven't watched the Lex Luger documentary yet that uh, I heard just came out. I'm I'm really curious because I know there's a lot of questions I've always had. I, I've I actually don't know if I've ever met Lex, but I certainly never had a conversation with him about any of this. So it's always interesting to see what happened happened there. But I, I do believe. I mean, look, they pushed them pushed him to the moon, right? Um, so I'll be interested. Don't spoil it, but I do want to yeah. say, hear more about it. It is excellent, and they have great footage of him when he was in the Packers, like practice wow. footage. So I mean, to me, I thought that it was great. It's about two hours, yeah. counting the commercials, but I thought it was great. But I just like loved the that stuff, like the stuff. I know we've seen stuff before of him on, on the Alex Express and stuff, but the Packer stuff and him playing football right. and what his coaches thought. I me, mean, I was like, wow, that, they really, really went deep into yeah. like his whole life. That's awesome. Yeah, look, I, uh, I'm anxious to watch it. It seems like he's had a really, I mean, definitely a tough road lately, um, or for, I guess, a while now. So see what happens. But, uh, man, that was a crazy time, all that. Everything we just talked about from you – know, that was like Lex Express was a mass marketing like machine, yep. you know, which is very different than 1985 when it's like you just have your local, local promo going versus a nationwide yeah. thing. Very interesting. Yep. yep. And they'll get into, too, how he was booked much better in WCW than WBF. I mean, they get into that whole thing. But you you got to watch it. It's a great documentary. You'll, you'll really booked, like it. I will. But he was booked great in WCW. I do remember that. It, a lot of it made sense to me there. Um, that seemed, as as I, I recall, more of a natural thing versus, you know, I'm coming down on the ship. I'm slamming you up, Zuna, and I'm the top baby face now in one hour. You know what I mean? Yep. So I'm anxious to watch it. Yeah, great build, obviously, with Luger beating Hogan, too. I mean, they get into the whole thing. but Oh, that's totally good. So I just want to ask you just to rewind all the way back, though, because maybe a very interesting part of your career, maybe the most interesting part of your career. How'd you get into ECW? I mean, obviously, you become Sign Guy Dudley eventually, but how'd you get in? Uh, I went... So obviously it's in Philadelphia. I lived outside Philadelphia. Um, as the story goes, I think it was, I don't know, one like one uh, winter break from college, I was home and I was literally flipping through channels and I saw Eddie Gilbert and Terry Funk. And I was, I was, I stopped for a second. I was like, I knew who they both were. I was like, what is this? Cause no one, they weren't on a major promotion. I wasn't watching wrestling a ton, but I love funk. I loved Eddie Gilbert and I was, so I started watching it. And I was like, this is great. They were promoting a chain match. And then a commercial comes on and says it's in Philadelphia. I'm like, holy shit. Like what's happening here? This is awesome. So I made it a point to go to the next show, which was at the ECW arena. I don't, um, might've been, I forget what, no, what super summer sizzler or something. And then I went to ultra clash, but during this whole time, I'm just blown away. It was reminding me of the NWA. It's all these cool guys, a lot of these local guys. Um, sad men wearing a wetsuit and having a surfboard. <laughs> and it's just great. He loves to hear those stories, too. Um, and I just, uh, I was a writer in, in, uh, in college. I did as a music editor, a features editor for my school paper. 
So I was covering concerts, I was doing reviews and I was on record releases and I loved it. And then I, I saw they had a program, ECW Action Wire, and I picked it up and on the back of it, it was like, if you're interested in contributing to the program, please call Gabe at this number. So I did uh, a couple days uh, later or whatever. And I said, hey, man, like, I definitely am interested in writing for you. You know, how do we do that? And uh, that's how it started. And so I started writing for the program, going to the sh obviously all the shows at this point. Then gave me to the photographer and I told him I'm a great photographer. Truth is, I never had done anything. I just wanted to do it. And it turned out really well. I have uh, some amazing pictures from that time, too, that I've often thought about like socializing somehow because it was, it was all ringside right it was through a couple of years of really cool time in ecw so anyway i'm doing all that eventually i did some fan cam stuff and whatnot but during this process i have very long hair it's the grunge movement i'm fully into that flannel everything and i walk in the lot and i had become tight with raven and uh stevie uh dreamer a few of the guys and I, I was walking in the arena one night and and raven stopped or stevie stopped me he goes you need to go see raven so I went over and he looked up at me, he goes, congratulations, you graduated. You are now sign guy Dudley, go up the street, get a poster board and a marker and come back. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> that is literally how it started. And then I came and just a, this is an interesting story. I think, um, I come back that night, you know, I have all, oh, they told me to get glasses too. So I had to get the sunglasses, punch them out, put tape on it. Dudley boys were already there. It was Dudley Dudley, Big Dick Dudley, Little Snot Dudley was the incarnation. Put me in the front row. They're like, you just hold this sign the whole night. You're going to be like the inbred brother or something. And I'm like, am I like, am I getting booked into an act? Like, what's happening? So that night, Tommy had Tommy Dreamer has a match with Dudley Dudley. Um, they go through the whole thing. Tommy's up. Tommy rolls out um, by my side of where I'm at, which is on hard camera. And I just stared at him and like kind of just made fun of him. And then all of a sudden he goes like this, he grabs me and he pulls me over the guardrail. This is not a spot. I didn't know anything about this. I literally say, what's going on? <laughs> and he throws me in the ring and he goes, watch the chair. And I was like, watch what and he just, you'll see the video if you, if it's around you, know, he just hits me with the chair. Uh, I didn't put my hands up cause I was, <laughs> I'd been around ECW long enough not to. And I just took like a horrible bump, but it was stiff. Right. And then he, then goes, picks me up and goes, watch the DDT. So now I'm, I'm just getting, you know, shooting on me at this point. Um, and that's how it started. So, you know, got in the back and it was kind of like an initiation into a different side of the wrestling business. Um, I think a lot of guys in those moments would just kind of stay there and that was fine. But I start going to wrestling school. I start doing everything I could to, to not to be a wrestler, is always to be a manager and uh just learn to take bumps learn everything i could so i, I ran with it as, as fast as i could and yeah that's that's how it started though never thought i thought it last like maybe a month <laughs> that's crazy gabe sapolsky of course kind of starts with him and, and just works the range getting beat up in the ring yeah i mean there's a picture on my wall over here of it's a sabu and taz match and you see on the on the stage at the ecw arena which was like up it was literally a stage. It was this elevator where they use hard camera. You see me and Gabe sitting there just doing like whatever we were doing. And it's so funny to see that picture and then see where, you know, he went in the business with, and same with me. And it's, it's very funny because it's truly like, you know, it's from, from ringside to the ring kind of thing. It's, 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 it's pretty cool. But yeah, yeah we, great. we got our jobs in ECW, man. We learned a lot, a real lot. And for him on the booking side, I think, you know, him working with Paul was awesome. I learned a lot about grassroots marketing and, you know, this is all outside what we were doing in the ring. I just, you know, there's so much other stuff that uh, we became aware of and were able to do. I was just talking to Devon, Devon Dudley, obviously. He was saying <laughs> that everybody had like multiple jobs. Yeah, He was totally. a wrestler, but he worked in the, in the office. Sometimes he'd answer the phones. <laughs> Sometimes he's taking orders. Like, so you obviously had multiple yeah. jobs you know what i mean like you're in the ring you're out of the ring yeah. you know you're doing this yeah that's just what the way it was it 100 percent. and as i as i started in the business 95 96 97 my, my bigger job my biggest job was to sometimes i had to get i guess the sports channel office if i remember correctly was in philadelphia paul the the, the tv edit would notoriously be late 
I'd have to drive to New York, get the tape, and I'm in Philadelphia. So Philadelphia to New York, right back to Philadelphia, drop the tape off. That was kind of like my thing. Um, but before that's photography and whatnot. But like Devon, you know, Dreamer with merchandise, all these guys had like definitely we were all working a lot of different things. And frankly, you know, coming back to Impact for a second, and there's a lot of the as I've been around a little bit more, there's a lot of people who are doing multiple things here. Um, not necessarily all the talent, even though, you know, I don't think that's as much expected because they have their job here, but they're also working all the other weekends with uh, other companies, but within the office staff and, and the merch guys and people who run the ringside production crew. I mean, it's not, that's not their only job. You know, there's always three or four other things and which is always awesome to see because the only way you're staying through that is if you're, if you really have a passion for it. And it's almost like everybody's in it together. This is a family atmosphere. Same thing as ECW. Yeah. You're going to hear my dogs barking. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, that's very, very true. It's very true. And, you know, and everyone's embraced equally too, which I, I think is, and that's again, very similar to ECW. You know, no, you're not sitting and listening to two guys going over their match or whatever, but you can walk through the locker room in a second. Everyone, you know, is cool with you. So things like that, I think, go a long way. Explain to me the Dudley Boy experience, though. I mean, obviously, you're a sign guy, Dudley. What's the experience like? Is sometimes, you know, they're heat magnets. You know what I mean? Like, sometimes it's crazy out there. Yeah, you know, I um, someone asked me that question like a year ago or so, and, and the answer I gave is the same as I feel now is, I was never really scared in, during those things because I had the two toughest guys in the locker room standing next to me. You right. know, um, Tommy Dreamer and Taz may take exception to that, but Bubba and Devon can go, right? And when Big Dick was there, I mean, he, he, you're good. Um, yeah. The only time, so I, I, I loved it. You know, I loved being part of that. I mean, there were some times that were hairy. You know, a couple times in New Orleans didn't go as well as we <laughs> probably wanted it to after the show. Um, there was another building, I think, at Fort Lauderdale. A fan, like, as I was going in the ring or something, grabbed me from up top of my hair and tried to pull me up into the crowd. Like, those aren't fun. Um, but, no, I mean, that's real heat, too. That wasn't just, like, oh, uh, whatever. Like, the people really wanted to, to hurt us. And mostly Bubba and Devon, but they just pick on me because I'm the smaller one out of all of them. And Paul loved that, right? Like, the because no, it's, like, no. controversy yeah. times 10. I, mean, I was there, you know, every time that Paul's like, give Bubba a mic and go light the place up and do whatever you want. And he did, you know, with Bubba, and I confidently say this, like he wasn't not like, he wasn't in the back, like rehearsing this, you know, promo that's written out. He's just go to the ring and just kind of like he used to say, I just black out and just kind of go. And he went, I mean, some of those tirades were legendary. And I know people knock it now sometimes saying, oh, it's just curses and blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, it's like there was heat and it was prolonged. It wasn't like a one minute promo that dies out toward the end. It was like it was always at this level of, you know, that whoever was coming to the ring, fans wanted them to kill us because of whatever Bubba or Devon just said. Did you ever want more for Sign Guy Dudley or were you happy with like where he was, so to speak? No, I'm laughing because I just told Scott this story um, last week. We we're in Toronto for some meetings and whatever. And I said, the the one thing nobody ever got to see was I had come up with a finishing like maneuver for myself. And, <laughs> and it was called, it was, I, Hunter was doing the pedigree. So it's the same move, but I was going to put my sign down and call it the sign off. <laughs> I love it. And I pitched yeah. it. I remember, I think it was to Bubba and Paul or Bubba and Dream or somebody. I just remember, so whoever it was, I said, hey, Bubba, like, I want to do the sign off. This is the idea. He looked at Tommy or whoever, and it says, this guy has a finishing maneuver now? <laughs> you know, it was just like, it was so hysterical. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never got to do it. Um, that was my idea. You know, I just thought it'd be such, like, heat. You know, all of a sudden, it's like, so first you're getting, you're getting maybe hit with a sign, you get powder in your eyes, and now you're getting hit with my finisher? Like, what? I thought it'd be hysterical, but never say never. If we ever do a Dudley Boys reunion, I'll see if I can do it. Unfortunately, I think with my knees, I, I won't be able to. But it's still fun to talk about. Yeah, maybe. Hey, maybe. You know, never give up. You never, you know. You never might be able to pull it off. Business either, so you never know. Did you like Louis Dangerously better or Sign Guy Dudley better? Uh, I mean, Louis was definitely. It's hard to say what I liked better because they're very different with Louie was a, as a character, a, a speaking character. 
um, a rip off of my boss, a rib on the locker room because, and on him, because there would be times I'd be in the locker room as sign guy with my ponytail and a black jacket on or whatever. And people would come up to me and say, Hey, Paul. And I turn around and be like, oh, you're not Paul. You know, it really yeah. was similar. So yep. we had always joked about it. Like, you know, when the Dudleys leave, I'll just do Louis dangerously. And everyone's like, no, 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 no. Dudleys are leaving. And Tommy's like, you're going to take three months off from in ring and probably do Louis dangerously. And I was shocked that it actually happened. Um, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I think from a development standpoint, that got me a lot further. But as sign guy, that's what people remember. And that's really, I really learned the business from every angle. You know, it's like not only you're in the ring and you're learning how to, you know, know when spots are coming or when you have to audible things or you just have to call on the fly and that kind of stuff. You're also learning the business, you know, and traveling with everybody and hearing every story and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was different points in my career because also when I was Louis Dangerously, I also had started as a promoter for ECW. So I was able to, you know, Jack Victory and I were going into towns. Usually our travel was like Tuesday to promote Friday shows and fly home Sunday and fly it back out Tuesday and the next day. So we were on the road considerable amount of time. Um, but what was good about it is because we were on the road and we were talent, we were on air, all the media appearances, anything like that that was happening in the market, we could just do, um, which side guy would not have been able to do. But in this right. situation, it does work. So there was a lot of there's positives on both ends. Um, but now as it comes back around, it's like, I get more of the sign guy stuff than anything, which, uh, it, it all blows my mind. Anybody remembers anything, but yeah. Oh, of course they remember. Yeah. I think it's funny though. Louis dangerously dangerous Alliance. And then like the guys start fitting into the beautiful Bobby role and like the different roles. That was always pretty funny. That was supposed to go further that I do. Really? I can't say. Yes. Um, it was going to evolve into me, CW, uh, Johnny Swinger, Simon Diamond, Dawn, I believe Bill, let's just say Bill. And that was going to be like, you know, Dawn would be like the Missy Hyatt, I'm Louis Dangerously, and these are the, you know, Simon. Yeah, Bill Quinn. is obviously Bobby Eaton. And yeah, yeah so. exactly. And it all was, we were psyched and it went that way um, where they did break everybody off and I just broke off <laughs> and went to uh, start working with Chris Chetty, which I loved also. Uh, doing danger zone segments and things like that, having a little feud with Joel Gertner. Um, so uh, there was a lot more on the table for that. And I, to this day, our best promos and the things we did never, never made TV. They live somewhere though. We did some hellaciously funny things. Then they were just all ribs. Probably why they never made it on TV, but it was fun. <laughs> little thing with Billy Corgan too, your buddy, Billy. That was huge. I mean, that was, again, sign guy not able to do that, right? And it's uh, Billy and I. Billy had showed up in his Chicago, our show in Chicago. It was actually one of the right the first pay-per-view after the Dudleys had left. So I'm not performing. I think I don't know what I was doing in the back, but something. And uh, somebody said, you know, the, the Smashing Pumpkins guy is here. Does anybody want to go say hi? And I, we're wrestlers are in the silo and bubble. It's like, the who? The what? I'm a huge music guy. I'm like, yeah, I want to go meet him like right now. The most mind blowing thing of that is when I was walking up to him, he starts smiling and he's like, You're a sign guy. And I'm sitting there like, How does Whoa. this guy know who I am? It like blew my mind, but he was a true fan of our product. And he said, The first thing he goes, You're a sign guy. What are you going to do now? The Dudleys are gone. And my mind's like, I mean, this guy, I, like, Smashing Bungus were huge to me. And I, I handled it really well. But in my mind, I was like, This is crazy. Um, but then we became really good friends, like pretty fast, actually, to the point where Louis Dangerously came in and I called him and I said, would you be down to like do something in the ring? And he literally said, as long as it's not cheesy, like I'm open to anything. And that's where we came up with what we did in Peoria, which was him doing the national anthem. I come out and interrupt him, hits me with a guitar. Later in the 90s in the ladder match with Jerry Lynn, Justin, probably Lance and Dreamer. And then we did the stuff at the Hammerstein where we gave each other shoot concussions <laughs> back to back nights. Um, we did a lot. It was a lot of fun. And then I, I came back out a little bit for him in 2012 to, to come back into the business to do some stuff in Chicago. And I got a concussion on the last show, and that was that was end game for me. So, damn, too many concussions for for a non wrestler. Way too many concussions. Yeah, well, you know, part of it too was you know that particular night it was just the spot went bad, and I had left the ring. I knew I had. A, I just know. And, but my whole realization was like, what am I, you know, I'm running a, 
a, a, a marketing team of 47 people in Las Vegas responsible for $500 million of revenue. I cannot get concussions on Saturday because the table didn't break. <laughs> like it's just, I couldn't yep. do it anymore. And that was, uh, and also too, I mean, for a non wrestler, uh, I do have, you know, I had my knee replaced. I had my right knees had surgeries. My elbows look like, uh, which one is it? This one looks like that. If you can see. Oh it. yeah. Yep. Yep. Maybe I'm doing all these like that. You know yes. I mean? like, all these things are kind of messed up. Um, so it, it was, if you can imagine, that's just me it, magnify that by a hundred times and that's everybody else that was there. So for ECW, you've probably been asked this many times though. Were you there for the end? The end of ECW just when it closed down in Pine Bluff? Yep. I was so there. You were there all the way through the end. 100%. I was there from, I mean, it was probably only like a year and a half I wasn't there. You know, me and Tommy, Tommy was the longest running guy. Obviously, Paul, but as far as like everybody else, Tommy, and I think then me, Gabe, Tommy gave me, like, we were there for for all of it. I'm, I'm probably missing somebody because um, a lot of guys jumped in and out, right? Sandman went to WCW, Raven went to WCW, WWF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, we were the whole way through. Pine Bluff was always the weirdest show to me because one, I knew it was ending. Like I knew this was it. Um, even though we've been told like lots of other things are happening, but we kind of just knew. And we did, a, the, the weirdest part is that we did an in-ring like toast to the fans. And because we didn't have a full roster that night, because a lot of guys just weren't coming because they knew they weren't getting paid. Um, there was a few like talent, local talent that had worked the show and they're in the ring doing the, the sign off to the sign off the, the toast as well. And I just felt weird. I was like this family of people, right. Is just broken up and no disrespect to the guys getting in the ring, but it seemed like off to me. The whole thing was strange. If you watch it, I don't get in the ring. I kind of just leave. Cause it was like, okay, but a weird night overall. You never know it's over till it's really over, but. It's a good weekend. We had fun. <laughs> it just it just seems so shocking. Like that's where it ended. You know what I mean? Like what the hell? Well, they Crazy. were they were sold shows. So the only reason we were able to do them is the pro, the promoters, whoever out there, the the town. Poplar Bluff was the uh, Friday. Pine, Pine Bluff was the, uh, the the next night. Whatever. Both situations were they paid us X Y Z money. I don't know how much it was to put these shows on, and that's how the, how that's how it actually came to fruition. Truth be told, on that Monday, I had no plans to go to those shows. I wasn't getting paid. Um, no airfare was booked. Nothing happened. Tuesday morning or Tuesday night, I'm on my way to like dinner or something, and I get a call like, you need to go call Paul right now. So I, I forget who called me. Actually, he called like my girlfriend's house. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, I call Paul. He's like, you need to get on a plane right now to go to Poplar Bluff. And I was like, am I going to get paid? You know, I'm, and so I, and he's like, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. I, and, and look, he was, wasn't that dismissive, but that was like the end result. And I called Tommy. I was like, what do you want me to do here? Like, I think I was owed, know, it was like $17,000 at the time. Whoa. And uh, I was like, I, how am I going to get paid? He goes, I will guarantee you, I will make sure you're taken care of. And he did. So that was, uh, that meant a lot to me. But the last week was, the whole thing was strange for sure. Was that a big problem for you? Just like, man, Paul owes money, owes money, owes money. Is that really eating at you? I mean, look, there was uh, – it, it ate at me, but I also did it. You know, I put myself in that spot. It's not like – I didn't have any leverage. Right, right? you could have left, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, you did that to Rob. It's that Rob Van Dam was a different discussion, right? It's like, pay me now or I'm not going to go main event. Right. Versus sign guy being like, yo, I'm not going to hold the sign. You know, it's just, <laughs> I had no leverage. I stuck in it because I had this, I, I don't want to call it a false sense of hope, but I truly believe that, that something was going to happen with the brand in by somebody buying us or giving Paul money. None of us knew like there was, he was already doing the WWE thing and Vince really was funding the company or doing those different things. Like we didn't know any of that. Um, so I stuck through it, but yeah, I was, and eventually, look, it's uh, things come back around. I'm still in the business. I don't know if it's because I stayed the extra month in ECW, but I definitely was loyal um, to a fault. And a, a lot of guys, not much anymore, but around that time, they just make fun of us. They're like, how do you go to work and not get paid? And it's it's hard to, like, describe what was happening um, back there. A lot of guys bailed out, of you know, for sure, which I, I agree with. 
um, for, for me and a couple guys, it was just like, we're going to finish up. We're going to do what we can. And we did. So we'll hit the wind down. We'll head towards the finish here. That That's just crazy, though, with ECW. Just the way it ended, like nobody saw that coming. I don't think unless you really yeah. were involved because it's just like, wow, we have WCW and ECW. And then they're both yeah. gone. So just yeah. crazy. Does Paul help you get into WWE when you get to WWE and you said in 2006? Uh, that was that was Tommy and and oh. Shane actually. Tommy and Tommy, uh, Shane was just uh, for someone I rarely barely knew at that time. He loved the idea of me coming there because of ECW, my past, and now my marketing experience. Right, like I have some business experience and whatnot. So it was those two guys talking to I believe John Laurinaitis, and it just kind of went there. I don't I don't want to say Paul wasn't involved. I'm sure he was because I, as soon as I was there, it's like him and I were talking all the time again about ticket sales and all these types of things. And so I'm sure they talked to him. I just remember the initial call came from Tommy, who then uh, another call came from Bret Hart, not the wrestler, the promoter, Bret Hart. And, um, and then Shane somehow got involved. And I was like, Shane was supposed to run that ECW. That was supposed to be his. So I was bought in immediately. I was like, oh, this will, it's not going to be what we remember at all but it's going to be a well-run like group uh, and that changed i think it changed like you know in a week or something like that i mean there were there were plans to buy the ecw arena to make it like a wwe place like they've done with nxt or at the time in um not nxt uh fsw i think whatever it was in florida like they bought a building set a ring up they had everything there um now the performance center is obviously eclipsed all that but that was a lot of the discussion and it was uh it was pretty awesome uh, end of the day, it didn't work, um, but I did, you know, I, I was there for another three and a half years on the marketing side, the brand marketing side. At the end of the day, it worked fine. I just felt bad for, for a lot of the talent who uh, they were promised a lot of things that never happened. So, so we, I mean, we talked, probably could talk to you for forever, but I don't want to keep you too long, but we talked about ECW and WB and and obviously you got impact going on so what's next though for impact and you like where do you kind of see the the jumping off point or like where do you see things going for impact going forward uh i think from a i'll tell you, i'll answer it two separate ways i think from what i think we do really well and this is a credit to jimmy and robert and the whole creative team dreamer scott is that we have storylines that are storylines and I think for a wrestling, and what I mean by that, it's not like there's a match and there's a promo in segment one. They make a match, segment ten, they have the match, and that's the end of the that's the end. It's all done, or it's done next week. We do a really good job of making those things go, and then pushing them into the next things and continue to evolve. And it reminds me of ECW very much because I thought Paul and Tommy did a great job of that. I think that continues. That's something you can't market that. You can only see it. I can't write on a billboard like we have the best storylines in wrestling, but I hope people see that. And part of hoping people see it is, you know, for me is its trajectory of getting more eyes on the product. And that starts, that starts with the live events that starts with pay-per-view eyes and all that has to feed into it in ratings. Um, so for me, that's the biggest thing right now, you know, is let's get more eyes on the product. Let's start some of these partnerships and promotions that we are, that I just mentioned to you because that gets more eyes on the product. Um, I, I see that as the number one, uh, number one priority. And I think that'll, you know, in tune, and that's not just me. That's the, uh, that's everybody. That's all the wrestlers. You, like I said earlier, social media, the promos, all that kind of stuff. I'm just, you know, it's my responsibility to make sure it happens, but I'm not doing all the work, right? Everybody is. And that's what I see as the most important thing in the trajectory right now. Um, I, I believe, truly believe we have a, a place in the market in the wrestling business um, with a different offering with what I just basically said, like I think our storyline does differentiate us from other people. Where can everybody find you and find impact wrestling? Impactwrestling.com has everything you need to know. It's the same uh, handle for Twitter and Instagram. And I'm on Instagram most of the time at Lou underscore D'Angeli. Sorry, the dogs. Uh, Lou underscore D'Angeli. And then Twitter's Lou L D'Angeli. Um, I'm pretty active on those platforms. Not just wrestling. I'm all over the place. A lot of hockey. <laughs> well, Lou, thank you so much for all the time. We're going to have to bring you back. You've got so many stories. Uh, you got so many uh, yeah, man. You, you, this, was a, this was a good one. Yeah, there's a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> 
I appreciate it, man. It was a good set of questions. I appreciate the time. Thanks for having me on. Happy to do it again.